Um, this whole day has been a very intense one, a very mind-focused one, a very exaggerating one from the point of view of an audience sitting up here all day long. Um, but we're keeping it going. We're keeping throwing the information out there for you guys to pick and choose the best for each one of you. And the next to come up here and uh, give you his take on things, it's probably a title that is could be quite controversial among the crowd here. From disruption to reinvention. So here's a guy who doesn't believe in disruption, one of the great principles that we've heard about so much these past days. And let's hear from himself why he doesn't believe in it. He's the co-founder and CSO at Babbel. Please welcome Thomas Hall. Thanks for the very warm introduction and uh, good evening to everyone. My name, uh, as said, is Thomas Hall. I'm a founder of Bubble and a chief strategy officer. And the controversial thing and the controversial claim really for me is about um, disruption is not a meaningful thing. And um, we as tech companies at least shouldn't actually be pursuing exactly that. So that's the talk. But first, let me introduce you to what we do at Bubble. Bubble is uh, one of the most successful language learning apps in the world. Um, we teach you a language uh, no matter what your goals are, whether that's to speak English, to actually improve on your career, or whether that's to talk Swedish, uh, because you might have Swedish in-laws, for example. Um, we do have 14 different languages that we teach, and our business model is based on subscriptions, um, roughly ranging between five and uh, 10 euros per month. With that model, that's pretty good because it keeps us aligned with our customer interests, so we don't actually have to sell ads or data or anything uh, like that. We can completely concentrate on the user and on the learning experience. And with that model, we've been super successful in uh, that we're cash flow positive since 2011. And we all know that market projections and where a market is actually going to be is uh, something that is partly made up, partly irrational, but it helps to set the stage. And the language learning market is a $60 billion industry. Um, so whether that's 60 billion, 70 billion, don't quote me on that, but it's like, it's huge, it's really large. The only really growing segment though in, uh, in that language, uh, language space is cloud-based language learning. That's the space where Babel plays in. And it's supposed to be growing to a $6 billion industry by 2021. So even though it's been a very, very um, large market, we've been super, super modest in the way we finance the company. Uh, initially, when we started out 10 years ago, we um, backed it up privately with our own money, spent the first few years there. But once we figured out we do have something that works, we actually raised um, three, uh, 33 million in uh, funding over, over three rounds. And um, are we disruptive? Um, when you're looking into that, I think that the first question that you've got to ask, what does disruption actually mean? Because so many companies right now are actually using that and it's become a very, very nebulous um, uh, buzzword, especially around startups. So one thing still is true about disruption and that piece is what actually gets disrupted. And it's usually markets and industries that are getting disrupted. So, just uh, something from uh, PR Newswire. Um, in 2016, more than 2,000 companies claimed to be disruptive or to have disruptive products. If you do the quick math, that's more than five disruptions that are happening per day. So, I think it's pretty clear that the term itself doesn't really help that much in uh, describing um, what it is. So what's the actual problem? Um, 
it's not that markets and industries do have problems. It's usually that real people do have problems. So I personally, as a, as a person, I don't care so much um, whether the company or the product that you're trying to sell is disrupting something. Um, so instead of looking into disruption and uh, taking markets and industries as starting points, I really believe we should be looking um, more into the value of actually solving users' problems. And for Bubble, this was really a uh, super elementary um, part. Because when we started 10 years ago with uh, Bubble, there was virtually no language learning online possible. However, the methodology, the way to learn a language, that is something that was established uh, since uh, probably hundreds of years. Um, the way to learn languages, I think, is very well um, established. Um, but the hard problem here in language learning is that going to courses, reading a book, and really sticking to that, that's actually a very, very hard problem uh, for most people, especially if you've got a very busy lifestyle. So that's the piece um, where digital technologies can actually help um, because um, with digital technologies, it can actually make all those boundaries disappear and um, make everything much, much more accessible and easier to use. I think one, not the newest example, but a really, really great one is that um, at some point in time, there was gamers, like people who would play games, and then there were other people who didn't play games, like your mom, like my mom. And then one day, something really, really interesting happened. It was scary, but my mom invited me to Facebook and to play Farmville with her. So super creepy, but th the great thing about that is you could notice that something really changed, like a line was being blurred. And people who wouldn't play games before now started to play games. And this was something that was not happening by accident, but somebody really, really designed that. Somebody did that. So somebody really invented, reinvented um, uh, the games. And that's really reinvention is um, at the heart of um, what we did um, at Bubble. And since the very beginning, we always uh, believed that we wouldn't just take existing content and put that content that existed in books, in whatever, and put that content online. Um, but we always knew that we actually had to get to all these features, um, get them together working with um, our tech team, with um, designers, with um, analysts and all of that to actually create a new way to learn a language online. And the scary thing here as well, once we were halfway done, the mobile phone appeared and we had to redo exactly the same thing again now for the mobile phone. So it's not really in our business um, to be disrupting um, language schools. Language schools and teachers are actually really, really great in what they do. They teach languages in a really good way. It's just that for most people, um, going to a school is something that is very hard to do because it doesn't fit in the, in the lifestyle. So we care about all those people who are actually um, uh, maybe intimidated by speaking up, by talking to someone. Um, we enable them to start learn a language because we really believe that's um, uh, what many, many people actually want to do. And um, I think the one thing that was always a priority for us was the learner. Um, that's what we focused on because when we started, there were no online language learning solutions, so we couldn't just copy something. We couldn't go somewhere and say like, oh yeah, we're going to build it like this and do the same thing. So um, it was all um, about reinventing the way we would actually teach and, uh, and learn. And the good thing is that worked. Um, so our users in, in our research, when talking to them, um, actually 75% of our users report they feel confident going into a conversation um, after just five hours of using Bubble, which is fantastic. That probably won't be the most intense discussion around philosophy uh, that you will have in your lifetime, 
um, but at least it gets the ball rolling. Um, once you get into that cycle of actually starting out, uh, understanding the Italian coffee maker, um, being able to respond, I think there is like a really, really great circle um, happening there to actually go back and learn and start using, using that. So what brought us there was um, super small lessons between five and 10 minutes. I think that's uh, super crucial. And internally, we always had, when designing the app, we had one goal said like, we need Bubble to be working after we had three beers. And I think every startup, every company that does mobile experience should run that as a filter because it really, really focuses you to make the best experience, to make it really, really easy. So what does all of that mean, actually? Um, I really believe that um, innovation, that for innovation to really happen, you need to solve real problems of real people. And you should take them as a reference point and as a starting point. You shouldn't think of industry, markets, um, how to create your startup. Because I think that will create a very, very lousy company. Markets might totally change. Industries might get shifted just by doing that. But I believe that should only be an afterthought. That shouldn't be the starting point. That shouldn't be the, the goal in the first place. So the great thing, and uh, that's probably the proof point why it worked for us and why I believe it can for work for, for many, many customers and many companies, is last year uh, we announced that we reached the milestone of uh, having one million paying subscribers on the platform. And we've really considerably growing that number in the last uh, one and a half years. Um, and yeah, putting users also first actually means to have a product where you can actually um, uh, learn, learn a language with. I think um, that might be obvious. It's not so true for uh, many other things. And for example, we did an uh, efficacy study with um, the City University of New York um, where they showed that with Bubble you can actually learn between 50% and 100% faster than with um, other apps. So I think that's all based that we didn't look into markets, into industries so much when trying to disrupt that six billion, $60 billion industry, but really thought about like what is actually the problem that we're, that we're trying to, to solve over here. And um, yeah, that really makes me super excited because I think we didn't even take um, one tiny bit of language learner who would not go to a language school anymore. Um, I think that's the interesting uh, piece there. I think we enabled so many, many more people going into um, uh, using Babel um, who wouldn't have thought of learning a language before. And some of those then went on to actually go on and uh, do language classes, go to teachers, um, et cetera. So I think that's where we at least haven't been uh, disrupting and destroying um, anything, um, where I'm super excited because it brings us closer to our vision, which was from the very beginning that we wanted to have everyone uh, learning languages. So thanks very much for the time. My name is Thomas and go on and learn a language yourself. Thank you, Thomas, mm. for being here. Mm. It is quite an inspiring message that mm. going, just going out and learning a language for yourself because mm. it's something that's very, very deep at my heart. I have to say, I tried uh, Bubble. Um, I'm improving my Italian. I'm completely confident inviting somebody over for a party mm. on Sunday. Um, Perfect. Yeah, it, it kind of limits my options, but mm. I've <laughs> I'm throwing a lot of Sunday parties ever since, which is great. Um, mm. So you've been talking quite a bit about uh, this disruption myth yeah this 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 big idea of, yeah. of disruption being uh the thing to do yeah. and the way i see it you start more from not disrupting something but looking at the needs rather than the established industry and going from there yeah right um when when we started it was really like we went online and my uh, my co-founder actually said like i wanted to learn spanish there is nothing online that was like 2007 so I didn't believe that in the first place. I looked into Google, but then really there wasn't something there and it was pretty clear Those were that the dark days, at yeah. some point in time there would be learning and language learning especially be happening online. And so that was the point where we actually thought, well, we're not language teachers, so we don't have uh, expertise in that area, but we thought that we would really would like to have such a product to use ourselves and not go through books or classes 
that we actually took ourselves and said like we want to build a product that I could use and uh, that my mom could use as well. Yeah. So just staying in that kind of mindset of the of not disrupting but kind of taking taking your personal mm. everyday needs or, or something uh, is there anything else not that you're mm. into that uh, area but something that you would like to throw out there for people to develop for your personal use in the future for my learning use or for Wha whatever yeah. area <laughs> comes to mind oh i think like when when starting a company there is like so many things obviously um, uh, that are not working uh, the the whole thing of like how do you register companies like on the b2b side i think still there is like so many things um, where you can solve really interesting problems for people and by that actually disrupt something but then again i don't think that like looking at some uh, industry and say like we're going to disrupt this one is actually the thing that will work yeah so it is mm. kind of a more positive approach i'm not sure if it's more positive i think it's uh, the approach that actually works better um, because it takes like something something real and uh, not something very abstract um, to be working against and uh, especially when you've got limited resources I think it really helps to understand who is your user, why are they doing that, and users necessarily don't talk too much about like, oh, I tried that product from that industry, um, but they have said like, I can't figure out how to get that thing done. Yeah. yeah. So, are there any questions at this point? We will be taking a couple for Thomas. Um, <laughs> yep, one right there, and two mics already on their way. Oh, no. There we go. Yeah, start mm. over there. Hi. Hi. Um, I wonder how do you develop the language courses? Mm. Do you develop them with language teachers, or how yeah. do you deal with that approach that you make it easy usable, but the language teachers have a different approach? Yeah. So that's one thing. We now have more than uh, 150 language teachers and uh, and language experts actually on board. Um, uh, within the company, so um, they are doing all of the um, uh, courses, they are doing like the progression, they make sure that the users learn with it and um, that they're looking into at what point do people drop off, what is the thing that people can't get ahead of, what can they remember, and then optimizing all of these things at the same time. And uh, I think that's the, the real, real benefit of having a digital product because you can change all of these things pretty much immediately once you notice them. Um, whether in the, like, if you've got a book, you print it, you ship it, and then after that, you're basically done with it, and probably you don't care so much whether that book is any good or not. Um, so I think, uh, coming back, yes, language teachers are super important uh, for us to actually do a really, really good product. All right, <coughs> I think that covers it very well. We've got one here and yeah. another one so coming up. Um, uh, thank you for doing Bubble because it's uh, it's really fun uh, learning languages with it. I, I use it since uh, uh, two months. Thanks. Very friendly, encouraging. Mm. Now the question is, uh, how many times did you test it with users before you launched it? Um, that's a very good question. We started somewhere in uh, August uh, in 2007, and developed the first couple of uh, iterations and the first couple of months completely on our own, showed it to like friends, family, got feedback uh, there before launching uh, formally. And the funny thing there was we would always get questions and question marks from, from our people that we tested with. How does it work? Like, which button do I press? How do I replay that thing? How do I go back? In the first probably three years, it was never about like, oh, I didn't get why I need to use that Spanish word instead of the other one. It was always about like the interface. Mm, I forgot my password. How do I log in again? What's the next course? Which thing should I be doing in the in the next thing? Um, so the user testing was and is still uh, super super important. Mm. So basically, what you were saying is that it was more important to get the interface right than, or more difficult to get the interface right than to get yeah. the language right for the user. Yeah, absolutely. That was true for the for the first half of the company's lifetime, um, that user interface always was the key. That was like blocking adoption. Um, I think we're in the lucky position right now that we can focus on both parts because user interface um, is good enough, um, at least for many, many people. There is still so many things to do, but now we can really dig into the, the learning aspects more. And uh, with these amount of people actually learning 
um, we're doing quite some interesting works on how learning a language actually works on a scientific base, um, because we've got the uh, enough data to use that, which historically before it wasn't really possible to do that. So that's really exciting. Yeah, I've had many people mm. try to explain the French subjunctive to <laughs> me. Maybe Bubble will succeed <laughs> uh, once you get to that stage. But yeah. uh, there's another question mm. from the audience. Yeah. Hi. I just would like to ask you, how many languages do you speak? Uh, so I speak uh, English, which I didn't learn so much through Bubble, um, but because I've been in New York for two years, and that actually forces you, and that's probably the best way to learn a language, go somewhere else. Um, then I do speak French. Um, and then basically I think I have uh, did most of the beginner's courses, one or two in Bubble, which covers like a very introductional level um, in at least Italian, uh, Russian, in, uh, what did I do, um, Spanish. Um, I wouldn't say I'm fluent in there, that would be way over exaggerating, but I'm understanding and I get by when, when I get into these countries, with a very strong accent, by the way, but. Pero el acento no es problema cuando puedes comunicar en español, es lo más importante. Si, si. Works. If that isn't yeah. fluent, <laughs> what is? Yeah. Um, any other uh, questions? No. People are all busy trying to come up with all the languages they mm. want to learn in the next couple of weeks. So what do you think? Um, is there a, a time horizon that you give mm. people? Um, what, like in, in, in what time frame could you reach a conversational level? That obviously totally depends on the time that you want to spend in and on your learning speed and on like how many languages did you learn before. For example, we've got a guy in the company who actually speaks fluently nine languages. Mm. And to pick up the 10th, we did a test with him, like learn Turkish in a week. And after a week of learning with Babel and other things, um, he was really able to go into German television as well and talk with a Turkish speaker on TV matters. So. I would say you can do one week and you'll be pretty fast. For most of the rest of us, I would say it's um, you need a couple of uh, weeks actually to be really there um, or five hours if you want to have a really, really simple conversation. Yeah, sure, mm. but I'm five hours is something that mm. we can all spare. There's one question over there. No. Hi there, um, I have just a question. Uh, I was uh, searching myself for a site uh, mm. where I can learn the Italian language uh, a bit better than uh, I do already. And uh, I came across uh, a lot of sites that offer the same service for free. Mm. Uh, I think your site is uh, a lot better, of course, mm. but uh, what's your business plan for the future? Uh, how will you um, mm. fight against those sites who offer some sort of the same service uh, just only for free? Mm. Um, good question. So like uh, so many companies and that's especially in the startup world, um, uh, probably in language learning, I see probably one or two companies each week coming out on AngelList or on Product Hunt or on, on any uh, sites like that because it's a very sexy topic. So there's like many, many companies that are going in there with a free model saying like, oh yeah, we're going to figure out how to make money later. Um, and that's a very hard problem actually, like how do you monetize? Um, so the way we're differentiating is really, we only focus about the learners. Um, we only focus on those people who have like at least some, some very small um, amount of money um, available to spend that and who are willing to do that um, for quality. So that's why we're doing lots of research on how to improve, how to get you speaking faster. And um, that's our claim and that's our proposition. Basically with us, you'll learn faster and uh, better than if you're doing, I mean, there's so many great resources out there. Probably you can start learning by YouTube and uh, what other sites them as well. But usually it's then like very hard to put all of the things together to figure out where exactly should you start, what should you, should you learn. Um, but yeah, with enough dedication, you can go to the library, rent a book, um, and uh, learn from that. Nothing is stopping you that. The material is good, it might just not be fitting you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Thomas. We've mm. got one last uh, mm. Q&A question over there. Hi, I'm Marco. I have a question. Have you ever woken up at night with a nightmare that nobody will need to learn languages anymore because there's an <laughs> intelligent earphone that simultaneously translates <laughs> and um, your app is obsolete? 
Yeah. Um, I think that's a, that's a very good question. Um, like, will we all uh, like be speaking 160 languages uh, in, uh, in five years? Um, maybe that's the case. Maybe not. I think it will, like, the ability or the n not necessarily need, but the inspirational part of speaking a language, um, it's much more than just the transactional piece. Um, I think for many transactional use cases, probably these apps will be good enough at some point um, where you like uh, you don't care about the relation to someone you say like um, I just want to get something done I want to do this and nothing else um, uh, and I want it the, the fastest way possible however I think uh, like there still will be a very very large um, point where because language is very closely related to culture how you grow up and uh, learning a language um, to actually show some commitment to that other person them as well so many of our, I think like very few of our users actually have to learn a language um, or they get fired or like something terrible happens. But they're learning that because when they go to Italy, they think they want to show some respect. They want to like talk to someone locally. And I think that part of the motivation probably will never go away. Mm. Thank you mm. very much. Thank you for your encouraging and interesting questions. And thank you, Thomas, for being here. Merci beaucoup et on va vous revoir peut-être là-bas. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir.